Well, thank you for having me on board. Um, I'm Father Jose Miguel Marquez Campo. I was um, just a few words of introduction for those who may not know me. Um, I was born in Oviedo in Spain, northern Spain, but we moved uh, to the United States when I was about three. And so all my, um, my non-seminary education took place back in the States. I went to Catholic schools, public schools, uh, high school, and then graduated from what was then known as Rosary College, now Dominican University, in River Forest, Illinois. I worked in, um, in a major hardware chain and then at a savings bank that has since merged. And then uh, I always felt a vocation to the priesthood, but I delayed my answering to the call. But I, in the end, the Lord gets his way, of course. And we went back to Spain in 1986, and I entered the seminary even three years later, uh, 1989, uh, the diocesan seminary in Oviedo. And then I was ordained on Pentecost Sunday, 26th of May, 1996. And I've had various responsibilities I've uh, in the diocese. I've been assigned to a, a pontifical basilica in the diocese as one of the confessors and one of the adjunct priests. Um, from 2007 to 2012, I was invited by Radio Maria in Spain to do to do a commentary on the compendium of the, Catholic, of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And then afterwards, I did a special literature and faith series on J.R.R. Tolkien and the Lord of the Rings and his huh. Catholic background and his literature. And um, I'm back in Oviedo, in the capital now. And uh, I've been celebrating the traditional Latin Mass in the diocese since 2008. And our little community is growing and... I mean, we're a valiant bunch, and uh, the Archbishop is, is kind to us. He's, he's, he, last year he visited us about this time of year in May, and he, uh, he's very encouraging. So I'm, I'm very pleased to be able to continue celebrating the traditional Latin Mass here. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, if you don't mind, Lou, I'll, I'll go next. Uh, sure, sure. I'm uh, Brian McCall. I am a, the uh, professor of law at the University of Oklahoma, where I've taught law. I, I write a lot on uh, Catholic jurisprudence and on um, uh, some of its applications in uh, the business kind of context. Uh, I am also the editor in chief uh, for, of Catholic Family News, which is a Catholic uh, monthly periodical. We also have some uh, video podcasts, audio podcasts that we do. Uh, I'm really honored to be following the footsteps of uh, John Venari, who shepherded that apostolate for, for many years. Uh, so, uh, it's, and I've known uh, Louis for, for a while. We've spoken at some conferences in the past, but it's been a little while since we've uh, had a conversation. So I'm looking forward to talking today. Great. And uh, I am Louis Varecchio. I have the uh, least impressive resume of the three of us. <laughs> I am a blogger at akacatholic.com. Uh, in the early 2000s, I wrote a, a faith formation study series called Harvesting the Fruit of Vatican II. And at the time, I was a uh, very conservative Catholic who really bought hook, line, and sinker, the message coming out of Conciliar Rome, that the council documents were... Uh, they're actually precious gifts from the Holy Ghost. They just need to be understood properly in the light of tradition. And these study guides that I authored ultimately received an imprimatur from uh, my archbishop. They were endorsed by the likes of Cardinal Pell and other well-known churchmen. And they were used throughout the English speaking world for a number of years. And I used to speak at conferences defending the council. But the more I delved into the conciliar text, and the more I compared and contrasted that text with what the church had always taught, it became clear to me that these two things cannot be reconciled. Mm -hmm. And so you could say that that was my traditional, uh, I beg your pardon, my conservative adolescence, <laughs> as I like to call it. And so for now, I guess from about 2010, 2012 onward, I've been what people would call a traditionalist, but what I would just call a Catholic. And so thank you for having me here, Brian. It's, it's really an honor and a privilege. Thank you. Well, I've been asked to, uh, to moderate this, uh, this what I think will prove to be a very interesting uh, conversation between the two of you, and whatever I can contribute modestly. Um, shall we go on to the questions then? Certainly. Sure. Good by me, yes. Oh, one of the questions that was asked is, do you believe 
the human element of the church has been in a state of crisis? If so, can you briefly state the nature of that crisis? I guess you want to, we can alternate, sort of each go first one question, then the next person. Is that, does that make sense, Luis? Well, I'm happy to let you go first if you want. Sure, that stuff. sounds great. I appreciate okay. it. Thank you. Well, I, I think that humanity in general, we would all agree, has been in an elevated state of crisis throughout our entire lifetime. And it's getting worse with every passing year. It's accelerating. And the reason for that, obviously, is the crisis relative to the church. Um, when I hear this phrase, however, the human element of the church, my f first instinct is to take a small step back just to recall that the church is both human and divine. And this unity of the human and the divine that is the mystical body of Christ can be thought of in terms that are analogous to the hypostatic union. Pius XII makes that point in Mystici Corporis on the mystical body of Christ. He says that as Christ was the union of both the human and the divine, so too is his mystical body. They're both one. Now, that said, however, whenever the church acts in the world, uh, teaching, sanctifying, governing, even though it's Christ who's teaching, he who hears you hears me, it's Christ who sanctifies in the sacraments, it's Christ who rules through the governing of the church. Every time the church so acts, it does so through this human element. Pius XII makes that point also in the encyclical. He says that even though it was entirely possible for Christ to dispense the graces that flow forth from the cross directly to mankind, and he could have continued the work of redemption uh, directly with mankind, and he could rule the faithful directly if he so chose, he wills, however, only to do so through the members of his visible church. In other words, through the human element of the church. And the reason why I go through all of that is because there's a tendency on the part of many sincere individuals today who genuinely want to be and remain Catholic. And they look at this church in Rome, the church that's been in occupation of the Vatican since the 60s, this church that claims to be Catholic, and they see this steady flow of poisonous doctrines on faith and morals coming out of this church. They see its deficient liturgy, that's an invitation to impiety. They see it legislating dangerous disciplines. And in an effort to try to make sense of what's going on, they look at this church and they say, yeah, that's the church, but it's the human element of the church. It's not the church. And I can understand why one might be compelled to think that way and the advantages of the view, but it's a deeply flawed view. The church is one. What we really see, in my opinion, when we look to Rome today, and all of these staggering number of poisonous things that are coming out of that church, we're not seeing the Catholic church at all. Not even if we lay all of those terrible things at the feet of the human element, it's not the church. So the true situation I think was touched on very well by Archbishop Lefebvre when he said that there's a conciliar church that has broken with the church of all time, and it's not the Catholic church. And so I think that in a nutshell is the crux of the matter, and that is the, the true nature of the crisis that we're living through. Well, I, I agree with a lot of what you said. So first, I won't repeat things that uh, you said that I agree with. Um, and and I, I think you're right. I think we, we do need to distinguish between the human and element, uh, human element and the divine element, just like even when talking about our Lord, we, we know he's one, but we talk about, you know, in his human nature, in his divine nature, which in our human language is never precise when we do those terms. But we, from our minds, we have to sometimes attribute or speak in that way. But, but I do think you're right that the church is one, even though she does have these two, these two elements. Um, that's a good reminder. I, I again, I, I think it is a crisis in that uh, there's always been ups and downs in the church. There's always been crises, but we live in a unique moment when the three main missions of the church to teach, to govern, and to say, and to sanctify are in a, a really, a unique way, um, dif really difficult for people to discern, to see the true church in the, in the midst of what's going on. Uh, and, and really the way I would describe it to answer the question is a crisis of authority uh, in that 
one of the ways that we do come to know things, and we'll talk about that, I think, later, how do we know things, uh, is through authority, is through authority guiding us. And when authority is, and I'll just leave it at malfunctioning for now, we, we won't get into all the details now, but when there's aspects of authority that are not doing what they're supposed to do in those three areas, uh, that leaves people uh, confused and not knowing what to do. And I think, I think we'd both agree, anyone who tries to argue there's no crisis in the church, everything's great, uh, just isn't living in reality or is willfully not accepting it. Uh, and, and we see the effects of that. You know, we don't even go through all the statistics of the just loss of faith, loss of practice of the faith, decline of morals uh, among those who identify themselves, who say they're Catholic even, is just, just beyond really ar any argument. And, and I'll just close by saying I've met several people over the years who have converted to the Catholic Church and I, I, to me, it's one of the greatest signs that, that God does say, no matter how bad things are, grace is still made available. Not don't lose hope. It's not hopeless. Because I look at it and say, humanly speaking, on a natural, like, I, I don't know how you've converted. Like, how could you convert in the milieu, the, 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 what you'd read in the popular newspapers about what the Catholic Church stands for or doesn't, is just the only explanation must be God granted you some grace to see through the haze the fog, use analogies uh, of our world to f come to it. And so um, that, again, that's all I'd really add to what you said. Yes, I, I would agree with both of you. And the fact that, uh, well, the crisis, certainly we can't deny it. Uh, I suppose there might be people who deny it, which is really mind boggling. Um, but this, this crisis really is complex in the sense that it's all encompassing. It's, mm -hmm. With the teaching, the teaching with the errors that are coming out of the Vatican on a consistent basis, the, the last ten years, especially, um, we have to be perfectly honest about that. The the liturgy, uh, much has been talked about the liturgy now with uh, the Vatican trying to uh, prohibit the traditional Latin Mass. That's never happened before in the history of the Church. I mean, we've had less than saintly popes before, of course, but not a systematic attack on everything, on the church teaching, on the liturgy, on dogma. Everything is just being turned upside down. It's, I guess the best way to express it is this diabolical disorientation, or as St. Paul says, misterium iniquitatis, no? the mystery of iniquity, that it's just, it's just staggering the, the, the absolute crisis. But to say that the church is in crisis is technically wrong because the church is the immaculate bride of christ now yes the human element that's true we are sinful the church is not and we don't believe in a sinful church we believe in her members that are sinful but the church is holy so we have this difficult you know terrain that their church is holy its members are sinners but at the same time as never before in her history error is being taught the you know on purpose we can say on purpose, error is actually being taught. Uh, liturgy is not being um, according to apostolic tradition. They're, they're pushing for the Novus Ordo. It's like, why is that so vital? What is wrong with the traditional Latin Mass that, as Cardinal Roach said, you know, the, the theology of the church has changed? Is that possible? Can it change so much, really, that the traditional Latin Mass, the, the right of all time in the Roman Rite, it's no longer suitable today, that it's such a danger that we have to prohibit it? I mean, it's it's really lunacy. So there's there's a deep crisis in the church, in its members certainly, but not the church as such. And we can continue on with another question: Is was Vatican II a major cause of this crisis? Sure. Well, I guess then I'll go I'll go first this time. Mm -hmm. uh, again, I think it, it is really either disingenuous or just not really very thoughtful to claim that the events of the Second Vatican Council from 1962 to 1965 play no role in this. Now, I think we can always, as with any historical developments or events, there's always many multiple factors that are causes. You can always go back, you know, what's the cause of that cause? So we can certainly have lots of debates about, you know, how much is due to the Protestant Reformation, to the Enlightenment, to these other, and there's a lot of room for debate there. But I don't think, it, it's just not possible, I think, to say that the the the, the documents, the event, have a large part to play 
uh, again, there are causes before it, most simply because they, by their own definition, brought about a substantial change, a major, I won't use substantial, so I don't mean that philosophically, a significant change in the church. And we see effects after that change. And it is, again, very difficult to deny no causal effect uh, between those. So I, I think that's, that's what I would say. I think one of the challenges that people have is, you know, you referred to the crisis as a crisis of authority, and I think that's accurate. But my understanding of that crisis of authority is people attempting to identify from where the authority is coming. And so they look to this church in Rome, and the Archbishop have called it the conciliar church, and I like that label because that church exists to propagate and promote the conciliar faith, which is not the Catholic faith. And so when we look to that church, and many people do, and they believe its claim, that is the Catholic church, the problem is they think that's the authority speaking, and it's not. It's an imposter. It's a counterfeit church. And I think if we apply that paradigm to the crisis, things begin to make sense. Vatican Council II is a great example. It's, it's essentially what John the 23rd had hoped it would be, perhaps not in the details. He died before it could actually progress beyond the first session, but it was the birth of a new church at Vatican II. And of course, it's a major cause of the crisis. It propagates false doctrines that endanger souls, something that the Holy Catholic Church never does, ever. And it's, it, it, we don't have a get out of jail free card that we can pass to the council uh, because it was just pastoral. It was, it claims to be of and from the Holy Catholic Church. It claims to be a teaching act of the Supreme Magisterium of the Catholic Church. The man who claims to be the Pope who promulgated all of its documents was very clear that it has a binding nature. And actually I have a, a quote in front of me that I think that's useful when we're looking at the council and, and the way in which it's presented to the world by the man who claimed to be the authority figure of the Catholic Church. He said that even though the council had a pastoral character and, quote, avoided proclaiming in an extraordinary way dogmas endowed with the note of infallibility, it nevertheless endowed its teachings with the authority of the supreme ordinary magisterium. And this ordinary and obviously authentic magisterium must be accepted docilely and sincerely by all the faithful. Now, if the council really did belong to and come from the Holy Roman Catholic Church, we would have no problem accepting its teachings docilely and sincerely. Because after all, our Lord's told us to be as little children, we must. And that's what little children will do when they look to their Holy Mother. The problem is, when they look to the Church of Vatican II, they're not looking to Holy Mother Church at all. They're looking at a counterfeit church. Hmm. Well, this this term about conciliar church is, is actually something that they say, too. I mean, those who are very pro-Vatican II, they themselves <clears throat> call this conciliar church. So it's not just um, a name that, you know, traditionalists are you know, mean about this and they told it the conciliar church. No, they say that. You know, so so there is something to say about the Catholic Church versus a conciliar church. Now, metaphysically, is that possible? Can there be two churches? Well, not really, no. The church is one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. But the term conciliar church is a term that those radically pro-Vatican II, you know, nothing was ever done as, as great as Vatican II, they, they themselves say conciliar church. So it's something that they admit. So that's something to take into, into consideration. Uh, moving along, is, is the new Mass legitimate? That is, can one be bound in conscience to attend it in order to fulfill a Sunday obligation? Uh, some of the viewers tuning in may not realize the genesis of this conversation that we're having. I wrote a blog post a few, it's probably been about a month ago now, uh, reacting to a, an article written by Matt Gaspers of CFN. And Matt and I and Brian engaged in a, pretty extensive correspondence back and forth, you know, asking questions of one another and clarifying positions. And I was really gratified by the degree to which we have agreements about the state of the Novus Ordo. Mm -hmm. And just if I may, for the benefit of viewers, I'm going to recap the things that you and I agree upon, Brian, the, the common ground that we stand on in this matter. We both believe that the Novus Ordo, we say, is not a Catholic right, that it's illegitimate because aspects of it, aspects intrinsic to the right, or defective. We're not just talking about liturgical abuses. 
as a whole, it's a Protestantized right, and it's a danger to one's faith. And for all of those reasons, it should be avoided. Um, now, this is another piece of evidence, if one is looking for evidence, to try to figure out if this conciliar church in Rome is actually the Catholic Church. This is an overwhelming piece of evidence that tells us that it's not. Because the liturgy, according to Pius XII, writing in Mystici Corporis, and he's not spinning anything new here. He's simply passing on what the church has always taught, and he's explaining it and expounding upon it for the good of the faithful, which is what the popes do. He said that the liturgy must conform exactly to what the church, out of the abundance of her wisdom, teaches and prescribes in faith and morals. This is important. It has to conform exactly. How many times have we heard defenders of the Novus Ordo say, yeah, this can be understood in a Protestantized way, However, it can also be understood in the Catholic way. Well, that doesn't cut it when it comes to liturgy in the Catholic Church. The liturgy of the Catholic Church conforms exactly to what the Church teaches and holds and believes. The Holy Father went on saying the worship that the Church offers to God is a continuous profession of Catholic faith. In the sacred liturgy, we profess the Catholic faith explicitly and openly. Once again, he's discounting the validity of this idea that if something in the Mass can be viewed and understood in a Catholic way, that that's good enough. It's, it's not. It's not good in Catholic liturgy. Catholic liturgy explicitly expresses the Catholic faith. And lastly, he says, the entire liturgy therefore has the Catholic faith for its content inasmuch as it bears public witness to the faith of the Church. And so I would argue that a Church that promotes and propagates and even obligates its faithful to attend a mass that's not Catholic and and its nature is that laundry list of defects that I just opened with. It's not a Catholic, right? Well, clearly that church cannot be the Catholic church. So I think hopefully that <laughs> answers the question. So again, I, I, I do agree and I would, I would stand behind. I gave a conference several years ago, the last time Catholic Family News had an a in-person conference on is the new mass legitimate. And uh, to, to be clear, I just want to be clear what I mean by that, because we agree, I think it's not legitimate. We're not talking about a valid confection of the sacrament, um, because that's a separate question, not one we're talking about. Uh, and uh, it is also true that there can be valid confections of sacraments that are illegitimate, that are, are not good. Just the most simple example, you know, a, a heretical priest who is a valid priest, he's been validly ordained, um, or a priest who confects the sacrament with the intention of committing a sacrilege, right? There, he, he may actually cause transubstantiation to occur, but but the everything else about it makes it a bad thing. You wouldn't want to support it. And that's what we're talking about. And that's why I, it's not a very technical term, but I like to say what I mean by legitimate is, is it good? Is it a good thing? Is it is it uh, good for the faithful? And also, what I mean by it is, it would it, we recognize it as a a proper exercise of the the power of the authority over the church, and in a broader sense, the proper exercise of any authority. We say it's legitimate because the 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 person making the decision or making the act has acted within the scope of their authority, has done something for the common good, um, and in those ways, again, I won't rehash all the reasons why, because I think we agree on those. Uh, I would say it's it's not a, a legitimate, and mostly because, to follow up a little bit on what you said, for something to be good, uh, it, it has to not just be have some, the absence of evil. So we can't just say, well, this is good because it doesn't outright have something bad. When it lacks a do good, so when you remove something, and by do, I mean D-U-E, so it lacks something that it it ought to have, just taking that away can be enough to make it illegitimate. So uh, again, on all the reasons I think we agree, I'm going to hold off a little bit. I know we want to get into it on the conclusions you're drawing from that, uh, Louis, about, well, this you know can't come from the church. I think we need to get into that question a little bit more with, with some other foundations. So I'm going to refrain from responding to the, your, the conclusion you drew at the end, but say we agree on those facts. Sounds good. Well, as a priest who celebrates both rites, and they are two different rites, um, uh -huh. I can you know, say that uh, a priest friend of mine and I, we, the problem is we haven't really made a list, and we should have done that. <laughs> but every, every so often, we find in the Roman, the Novus Ordo Roman Missal, the Editio Typica for, for Spain, um, 
quite a number of badly translated um, elements, and frankly, even even some prefaces that are that are not even translated from the official Latin text, but are you know made specifically for the Spanish Missal, that has positive error in them. Uh, there was a recent translation done in Spain in 2016. I even wrote about it um, on Louis' blog, by the way. Uh, the, pen the new Pentecost, the proper Pentecost uh, preface, it, it's, it's based on uh, Gaudium's Fest number 22 and that problematic affirmation the Council says that by the Incarnation, Christ has united himself to all mankind. It's very problematic, and in this new preface, a new one, it's badly done because it infers that by in virtue of the incarnation, we all belong to Christ. No mention of faith, no mention of baptism. That's just plain error. And I wrote an article on that. So the Novus Ordo has these things that are not Catholic. They're theologically wrong. They're texts that are either translated or composed anew, supposedly reviewed in, 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 our, in, in our case in Madrid, and then verified in Rome. Well, someone's not doing their job because they're letting errors, flagrant errors, slip through. Now, it's true that maybe faithful don't pay attention to this, you know, but we priests do, we should. And, you know, I cannot in conscience say what that preface says when I say when I say the Novus Ordo. I have to change it because it's wrong. And I don't want to mislead the faithful. But that doesn't happen in the traditional Latin Mass, you see. Mm -hmm. So the Novus Ordo is, is problematic. It's, it's valid when it is, <laughs> but it's not legitimate in the sense that it's not wholesome enough to be considered a Catholic right. Yeah. What is necessary to be saved according to the traditional teaching of the church? Important question. Uh, Brian, I think it's your turn. Oh, Brian? Oh, it is. That's right. Sorry. I forgot. <laughs> yes, I forgot. Sorry. Um, so again, I think traditionally, uh, as the church is taught to be saved, you have to uh, be baptized, right? And you have to believe all the truths which the Catholic Church teaches, and you have to be submitted to the Roman Pontiff. Now, little, I was going to give a little gloss on what we mean by that. Um, let's start with the second one. I think we have to believe all the Catholic Church teaches. That's the act of faith, right? What do we mean by that? We mean we don't mean you have to be a theologian. You don't have to be Saint Thomas Aquinas. You don't have to know every detail of everything the catholic church teaches because you just you may not know all the detail uh, a priest should ensure if you're an adult convert that you know certain rudiments of the faith but when we say we believe all the catholic church teaches we mean i believe everything i know that they teach and if if i find out oh by the way this is another dogma of the church then i believe it because the church teaches so we have to be careful with that sometimes people can get a little confused and think well you know you, you didn't know this or you didn't know that so you're not catholic it is a, a disposition of mind that I, I guess, as the prayer says, I believe all that all that God has revealed because he has revealed it. So our, our belief in all the Catholic Church teaches is because God has revealed these truths, we believe them, not because we like them or because we have figured out on our own. We have you know, impossible. We have figured out the Trinity and we understand it. So now we believe it. We as traditionally we believe so that we can understand. So that's, again, an important point. And as to the, uh, and, and I'm going to leave the baptism because I, I don't think it'd be helpful to get into a whole diversion about the, the question of uh, baptism of blood, baptism of desire. I think it may get a brain topic, but I'm just going to say have to be baptized and maybe we can just leave it at that. For the third, um, being submitted to the Roman pontiff means you must accept that Christ established by divine constitution a church with a head, St. Peter and his successors, and you have to submit your will to that authority properly understood so again we may get into that later was submitting your will to an authority is 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 something that is very distorted in the modern world so we have to make sure we're clear of that but you have to accept that he is the authority so there for example that's why schismatics or the eastern or so-called quote orthodox uh, don't accept that. They say there's a pope. Yeah, he's one, but he doesn't. He doesn't have the supreme authority. So you have to accept that. What it doesn't mean, and this is as important, is that you you don't have to be correct uh, uh, in knowing who that person at any moment in time is. So you could still be submitted to the Roman Pontiff 
and be, let's say, for example, mistaken about his identity. So let's say you lived 500 years ago and it gets reported to you uh, that um, so-and-so is the elected pope. She's, oh, yes, I'm submitted to him. And, and then you find out later that that was a false report. Well, you were not outside the Catholic Church because you had this false understanding at the time because you were still submitted. You were saying, whoever is the pope, I am submitted to them, uh, even if you're mistaken. And again, I'll use a real example. We know that during the Great Western Schism, when there were multiple claimants to be pope, uh, that St. Catherine of Siena and St. Vincent Ferrer strongly disagreed and on which claimant was the legitimate pope at the time. And they certainly in their disagreement didn't, you know, weren't saying, well, you're, you're not a Catholic anymore because you're not submitted. They recognized there was a distinction between the disposition of the soul, the will, I am submitted to the Roman pontiff, and living in historical moments uh, about, you know, well, okay, well, who is the person that that action happens to be at this point in time? And the last point I'll put on that that is important is in that Great Western Schism, when the church actually resolved it, it's interesting that the way they that she did it is uh, she said to the claimants that were still around, we want you all to resign and we're going to start fresh. And she just said, she didn't say, we're going to have to go back and figure out who you were. And there's a, still a bit of a cloud. And there's some other cases over kind of who the right person was at the time. The crisis was resolved. We now know going forward who it is. But those who maybe were mistaken or who um, thought a particular anti-pope was the pope and find out their factual error, that's not what we mean by submission to the Roman pontiff. It is if you were to find out who it is, you're, you are not turning your will against them saying, well, I know you're the pope, um, but I'm just not going to submit to you. I don't recognize your authority or I don't recognize the nature of your authority. Yeah, I think that's a, a good distinction, Brian, about the identity of the Pope. And one of the things about the Great Western Schism that I think is noteworthy, if you were to, if you were alive then, and, and all this madness is happening, and, you know, as a matter of faith, you know, something's wrong. The church is going to rectify it somehow. Nobody really knew how. <laughs> you know, it's only in the aftermath of the solution that people could look back and see how the situation would be corrected. And I think there's something of that going on today where none of us can really claim to have all the answers about how we're gonna emerge from this situation. There are questions that people ask that are certainly valid questions about how we move on from this situation that I don't think anyone can answer. It can be just conjecture. But when we're involved in a situation where there's a lot of questions that we really can't answer, where we have to hang our hat, where we have to firmly plant our feet is in the things that we know. And some of the things that we know are concern the ecclesiology of the church and her inability to endanger her faithful and things of that nature. And we'll get to those. As far as being subject to the Roman pontiff is concerned and uh, going back to membership in the church and what's required, I would say it's important to know that just manifesting externally or professing the true faith, or as Vatican I put it, maintaining the rule of the true faith, it's more than just being able to externally manifest and profess the dogmas of the faith. The content of the faith is, is much broader than just those things that have been infallibly dogmatically defined. Uh, Pius XII gave a concise and very good definition of what's required in order to be a member of the mystical body of Christ. Again, in Mystici Corporis, he writes, actually only those are to be included as members of the church who have been baptized and professed the true faith. Elsewhere, he says the cooperation of all its members must also be externally manifest through their profession of the same faith, sharing in the same sacred rites, participating in the same sacrifice and the practical observance of the same laws. And that encompasses all of the things that you spoke of, those, those three elements to membership and what it's, what's necessary to be saved. Um, so what does it mean to be subject and submissive to the Roman pontiff? Well, I think one of the things that would be helpful is to consider, you know, who is the Roman pontiff? We have to identify who he is, and, and it, that answers why and how we're submissive to him, I believe. The Roman Catechism describes the Pope as the father and guide of all. And at Vatican I, it tells us that unity with the Roman pontiff is a unity in profession of the same faith. 
And it goes on to say that the Church of Christ becomes one flock under the one supreme shepherd in this manner, so that the pastors of the church and the flocks of the entire church may be taught and guided by him in the way of salvation. Leo XIII says it's absolutely necessary for the simple faithful and their pastors both to submit to the head and supreme pastor, the Roman pontiff. Now, the reason why we need to uh, be able to profess the one faith with the Roman pontiff is because he's been given certain gifts to be able to be our rule of faith. And he's that voice, the contemporary voice in the church that is the living magisterium that explains to us the content of the faith and how to apply it in our daily lives. At the First Vatican Council, it says, the gift of truth and never failing faith was therefore divinely conferred upon Peter and his successors in this see, the apostolic see, so that they might discharge their exalted office for the salvation of all, and so that the whole flock of Christ might, might be kept away by them from the poisonous food of error. Now, I want to make a comment about this word might. When Vatican I says that these gifts were conferred upon Peter and his successors, that they might discharge their office and they might keep us from the poisonous food of error. It's not in the context of, well, maybe he will, maybe he won't. What it really means is these gifts are given to the Holy Father to enable him to do that and to function in this way, because that's the function of the Pope. And it's for this reason that our Lord could say we need to be as little children, because we have a Holy Father who is father and guide on the way of salvation. And we could be confident that if we profess the faith that he professes, as he understands it and explains it, that we'll be on the sure path to salvation. Um, there's one other quote that I want to give you that I believe is, is pretty important if I can find it. Okay, so Pius XII, and this again, I think this might be, in, yeah, this is a Mystici Corporis. He says, the Lord enriches his pastors and teachers and above all, his vicar on earth with the supernatural gifts of knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. I'm going to stop there for a moment. We're not just talking about natural knowledge and understanding and wisdom, as if, you know, it's, it's a degree that's going to be obtained from a pontifical university. No, it's a supernatural knowledge, understanding, and wisdom that's imparted to the popes. And I'll pick up the quote here. So that they may... And again, may meaning enabling, enabling them to loyally preserve the treasury of faith, defend it vigorously, and explain it and confirm it with reverence and devotion. So if we take all of these things together, excuse me, submission to the Roman pontiff means that we're obligated to profess, as with one voice with the Roman pontiff, the same faith, such as he defends it, explains it, confirms it. And this is simply because he is uniquely endowed by Christ with these supernatural gifts that enable him to serve as our father, our teacher, and our guide. Now, with all of that said, let's bring it to the current day. And we have Francis reigning over this Concilia Church in Rome. I would dare say that there's probably not a single individual watching this podcast today who can honestly say that they look at Francis as their father, their teacher, and their guide to explain and to protect and to guide on the way of salvation. God help them if they do. But anyway, that's a long answer to the question. Yes, well, there were, I think we've great points, both of you. And we've, we've actually uh, talked about the, the next question, which was assuming submission to the Roman pontiff is part of the prior answer. How do you understand the settlement? I think you've also answered. I would only add um, all truths must coalesce to make the whole thing work. In other words, when we say we have to profess the, the Catholic faith, we have to receive baptism, live the life of grace, and then be in communion with the church hierarchy with, and submit and submit to the Roman pontiff. All that is true, of course. We know that um, it was uh, Boniface VIII in Unum Sanctum, 1302, uh, Eugene IV in the Council of Florence, 1442, we have to be sub submitted to the Roman pontiff. That's true. But in order for that to be true, another thing has to be true. The Roman pontiff also has to be submissive to his, to his office. He's a successor of Peter. He is the vicar of Christ. He's not Christ himself. Even Benedict XVI said that the Pope is not some absolute monarch, that he can do whatever he wants with the faith. So the Roman pontiff also has some conditions for him to actually be the Roman pontiff. Otherwise, if that doesn't work, 
the other things don't apply to him. See, that's that's where we're turning into this uh, difficult uh, difficult area. 